to finish off uh, the very tail end of where we were at yesterday, uh, which was materials stuff, I'm going to switch to a laptop, see if it actually goes. Maybe, maybe not. Nope, nothing. Doc cam. Oh, I get one for a sec. The doc cam is going. Switch to the laptop. Oh, it would help if I plug the laptop in. Uh, just a sec. Nothing. Come on. There we go. All right. We can do this. Um, so, uh, yesterday I'd been talking a little bit about the spectrum of, of different materials and how the architecture or the, the molecular structure or the grain structure, uh, how that all affects the material properties. Here we have kind of a nice property plot. So, this is a, something known as an Ashby plot. So, there's a guy, Mike Ashby at Cambridge, who's uh, now an emeritus professor there and runs a company called Granta Design. They have the software CES EduPack and they make these really neat plots. There's a whole bunch of material properties. I think somewhere in Washington we have access to it. But I'm still trying to figure out how to get access to it because uh, it's buried in somebody's account somewhere. But this is a nice example of a, of a materials property plot. So this is Young's modulus versus density. So this shows uh, at the top right you have very stiff and heavy materials. So metals, ceramics in the, in the red and yellow boxes there. Uh, composites are in that purple box, then going down to polymers and natural materials, all the way down to foams. And you'll notice each of those has a bubble, uh, kind of a, a oval drawn around it. That's because there's a range of properties that each individual material can exhibit, depending on their processing conditions, their heat treatment, whether they've been cold worked or not. And so that, that bubble kind of is a little bit of a representation of the, the range of properties that an individual material can reach. It's, it's sort of a conservative estimate, and if materials are, are sufficiently different, so going from polyethylene to Dyneema fibers, remember it's the same constituent material but a very different architecture, I think on a plot like this they would actually have different bubbles, just because they're so dramatically differently processed, uh, this doesn't really necessarily consider them as the same material. But there's a pretty wide range of material properties that you can get. And so this is a nice way of visualizing here's, here's kind of the full space that you can, you can explore. And this is just Young's modulus and density. There's, there's a huge range of different material properties that you can look at. Strength versus density is also a nice one to look at. So again, uh, strong, heavy stuff is in the top right. So really, really dense things like, like steels and, and uh, your tungsten. Uh, tungsten carbide, and all the way down is, is your polyethylene or your your polymer foam, so your styrofoam, for example. Uh, my research, actually, in my PhD, was uh, to extend this property plot, and for a little while we had the world's lightest material. So this property plot goes to a density of 10 kilograms per meter cubed. A couple important uh, points here: a thousand <coughs> is the density of water, so a thousand kilograms per meter cubed. So <coughs> water kind of lies at that line. Pretty much everything below water, you have to have structure. So it has to be some sort of foam. You have to introduce some sort of architecture to get it below that density. Solid, solid materials, so solid metal, solid ceramics can be above that. But to get so here, this is 10 kilograms per meter cubed. The density of air is 1.2 ish at, at standard temperature and pressure, atmosphere, one atmosphere. Uh, and we were able to make materials that were about 0.3 kilograms per meter cubed. So we made things that were structurally about a third or a quarter of the density of air. If anybody's interested in talking to me about that later, I would be happy to. Sort of on that, a really quick pitch. So I uh, run a research group here at University of Washington. I actually have a research posting open for an undergrad research opportunity in, in materials research. So if any of you are interested, sometime maybe in the middle of this term, I'll, I'll start interviewing people. So. I have a posting on it at, uh, what's the number? Is it somewhere on there? I will send it out in a notification. Uh, but I have a link to, to this page. And if, if you're interested in working on 
something known as a tensegrity metamaterial, uh, then this this project may be interesting to you. And it uses a combination of nano two photo nano three D printing, two, which is two photolithography, and pyrolysis, which is a, a way of burning off all the the organic molecules and leaving you with pure carbon. So, anyway, fun side pitch. Let's actually get to some of our stuff for today. Uh, where do I want to start? Over here. Okay. So yesterday we kind of went through different types of materials and how their structure affects their properties. Today we're actually going to get into mechanics. So this is sort of the core of the course. This is what the course is supposed to be focused on. So I know all of you have had MSE 170 and CE 220. So today will probably be mostly review, hopefully. Uh, it's just nice to kind of make sure everyone is sort of on the same level and we have the same base going forward. So a review, let's start with a review of basic mechanics. So this will probably extend even before CE 220 material. So this is going to be very, very basic. Uh, if you, if you, so kind of looking at the uniaxial tension test. So if I take some block of material and I pull it with some force P, it has an original length L naught, it has a final length L, it has some original area A naught, and some final area A. We can define from this simple uniaxial tension test our stress and strain. So our stress here is defined. Uh, sorry, let's hold up on that first. Uh, so our, our stress, which generally we're defining this as engineering stress. Let's move this down a little bit is by the load that I'm applying over my original area, and my engineering strain is the uh, change in length minus L naught. So engineering, uh, most of our engineering quantity, so we're dividing here by the original length and the original area, we're doing this because it's easy, uh, so we're taking the easy way out in, in calculating these quantities. You can also look at true stress oh, and strain, true stress and strain, where instead you divide by the instantaneous area. And for our strain, it's a little bit trickier. So, so the stress, as, as this dimension changes, actually, are these, is this writing a little bit too small for people at the back? I just realized it was, it's okay? Okay. I realized I was writing that a little bit small. If I, if I, if something is ever illegible, which is highly likely, just let me know and I'll, I'll rewrite it in bigger scales. Uh, so our, our engineering stress, pretty straightforward, you divide by the instantaneous area. Our engineering strain now, we are dividing sort of by the instantaneous length, but we're going to be dividing by the instantaneous length at every small point along the length. So here, basically, I, I when I have my extended rod, two, 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 I'm going to look at the change in length of every individual subunit, Li, and I'm going to go kind of an infinite sum all the way down. So my engineering strain is actually the the change in length of segment I, so the change in length of segment one over the length of segment one, change in length of segment two over, uh, over L, two all the way down to the change in length of segment N over LN. Now, uh, this we can take as a sum, which when we take an infinite sum, it turns into an integral. So this then becomes the integral of our dl, our delta l, 
small change in length over L, and we're going to integrate that from our original length to our final length. This then becomes the natural log of L over L naught. And if we look back at our our engineering or yes, our engineering strain definition, sorry, I shouldn't use the same symbols. Uh, true stress, true strain here, I'm going to denote by this little uh, apostrophe there at the, at the side. Some people use a, use a tilde over the top of it. Some people, I don't know, I've, I've seen it a couple different ways. Here it'll just be with that, that tilde mark there. Uh, when we take that, we can resubstitute our engineering strain and say this is then 1 plus our engineering strain epsilon. So this is kind of where you may have seen that formula for true strain before. This is sort of where it comes from. You're taking the, the infinite sum of the change in lengths along the whole thing. So uh, what we then get from this is some sort of a stress strain curve. <coughs> Let's call this our strain. Let's call this our stress. From this, there's some elastic modulus, some plasticity region and some hardening points and eventually a failure point. So we can define a few quantities in this. So here we have uh, an elastic region and for the rest of it we have a plastic region. In this elastic region we're going to sort of, ooh, let's see if I can keep everything on screen here. In this elastic region, we assume that there's a linear relationship. I'm going to tell you now that that's not exactly true. So if you remember in, in something like a metal, dislocation motion dominates the deformation. In a plastic, you have sliding between the, the in a polymer, you have sliding between the polymer chains. At every, at any applied force other than equilibrium, there will be some motion in there. So there'll be some dislocation motion, there'll be some grain sliding, there'll be some polymer chain motion that may or may not be permanent. The idea is that this is mostly elastic. It's elastic enough, so linear. It's mostly linear. It's linear enough, and it's mostly recoverable. So that's why we kind of ignore all of the, the little plasticity mechanisms that are going on in there. And we say this is an elastic regime. In that elastic regime, here we have some slope E. And we can say our stress is related to our strain linearly based on that in this region. Uh, we can define based on, oh, I should have drawn that E on the other side. We can take oh, here a 0.2% strain offset with that Young's modulus slope, call this a yield strength. This is sort of arbitrary, so like I had just mentioned, there's always some plasticity happening, even in even at very low strains in this elastic regime. What we're doing by saying there's this 2.2 by using this 0.2 percent offset is we're saying at this point the material is sufficiently plastic where we're going to say it started to yield. And so this is a, a sort of arbitrary definition, but it's a very commonly used one in engineering, because as engineers we aren't necessarily looking for what's exactly true, we are looking for what's useful. Uh, so here we have where that point intersects, that's our yield strength. You can also define this as a yield, oh, this is as a yield strain. If you've set up your graph better than I have, you'll probably have room to write stuff. Uh, here the max stress is our ultimate stress, sigma u. So sigma y here is yield strength sigma u ultimate strength. Eventually, depending on your material system, this is kind of a nice representative curve for a metal, a, a ductile, a highly ductile metal. What's happening in this region, we're going to call hardening. So after, after the point of yielding, after when this plasticity starts to go, uh, if it was, it, it, could, it could go straight, it could go down, it could go up. 
if if it goes up like this, we're we're den we will denote this as hardening. If it were to go down, it would be softening. If it were to go perfectly straight, we would have perfectly plastic behavior. Uh, here, then, in this final region, this this drop in stress, this softening here, isn't actually a real phenomena. It's due to generally necking. So necking in this region, and that's because when failure starts to happen. Oop. Let's do that. Let's do that. Oh, that's very uneven. Oh, this is a very ugly dog bone specimen. Okay. So, if I were to take this dog bone or this tensile specimen and pull it, eventually this would be uh, necked region in a very ductile material. Uh, yes. Haha, <laughs> sorry about that. So, this would be a necked region in a ductile material. If instead you took the true stress and strain, doo -doo -doo. our engineering stress kind of goes up and drops down, our true stress stress, our strain stress, then that, that drop in the stress would go away because it's, it's sort of an artificial phenomena from the geometry. There's a couple other things we can define. Let's pull out more paper. So here in that linear elastic regime, we had our, our Young's modulus. Let's pull this paper back over. So, so the slope in a uniaxial tension curve is our Young's modulus. So, Young's modulus comes from our uniaxial tension test. This is very exaggerated. Uh, so it's it's the slope of our stress versus strain. We can also define a shear <laughs> modulus, where if I take a block, it's originally set up like this, and I shear it a certain amount this way. This is some shear stress gamma. I'm applying some shear to the top tau, then our tau is related to that gamma by our g, so g being a, a shear modulus here, e being the Young's modulus there. We can define a Poisson's ratio, so again in a, in a uniaxial tension test we have here some L naught and some final L. We also have some W naught and some final W. So as, as I pull the specimen, generally, uh, it'll, it'll start to narrow out. That change, so I can call this my epsilon, uh, let's define coordinate systems, let's call this x, let's call this y. So my epsilon x, uh, epsilon y is my L minus L naught over L naught. Epsilon x would be W minus W naught over W. I can define a Poisson's ratio. New is equal to my the the ratio between the the axial and the lateral uh, the axial and the lateral expansion the the amount that it stretches in the amount that it contracts after after I apply uh, some strain to it axially generally this this Poisson's ratio is around 0.3 ish but 
it can that technically exist from negative 1 to 0.5, and I'll touch on that in a sec. Uh, what else? We can define a bulk modulus where if I have originally some big block of material and I then go and compress it down with a uniform force P to here. Oh, this is very ugly. Some force in the back. All of these are uniform forces P. I can define a bulk modulus K is equal to the volume change dV d, uh, d, P dV. So these are some general quantities for, for engineering materials that we can define. Generally, these are things that we can test. So, so a Young's modulus in, in the lab next week, you'll be measuring a, a stress-strain curve for a few different types of materials. So you'll get a few of these different stress-strain curves popping out, and you'll be able to measure Young's modulus, Poisson's ratio. So uh, shear modulus, you can also measure. It's a little bit more difficult. Bulk modulus, bulk modulus you can also measure. And again, it's, it's a more difficult to measure experimentally. <laughs> But these are all sort of the really basic definitions of, of stress and strain, or uh, of, of some engineering quantities that you'll you'll be able to, to get experimentally. These all actually relate to each other. So there's out of these four uh, material quantities, you only need two of them to know the other ones for an isotropic elastic material for an isotropic homogeneous material. So for Homogeneous isotropic material. I can say now, if I have, say I have my Young's modulus and my Poisson's ratio, my bulk modulus relates to those. Uh, there's some equation for it somewhere. It's equal to E over 2 times 1 plus nu. My bulk modulus is equal to E over 3 times 1 minus 2 nu. There's, uh, there's another parameter that I'm going to tell you now that is useful later when we do the full 3D version of Hooke's Law, and that's, that's a lambda, which is Lemay's First parameter. This is e new over one plus new one minus two new. Uh, and actually, there's so Lemay, uh, Young, Poisson. These were all physicists or engineers back in a couple hundred years ago, lots of whom were in France, I think some of whom were in Germany, maybe a couple were in England. Could you rewrite that one and add the one? This one? Yeah. Yeah. E nu, for one plus nu, one minus two nu. And so actually there's there's a really nice table online if you look up LeMay <coughs> parameters on Wikipedia, actually. Wikipedia. There's a there's a huge table that shows all of the different relations between these five quantities. So Young's modulus, Poisson's ratio, bulk shear, bulk modulus, shear modulus, and, and LeMay parameter. And so if you know any one of these two for a homogeneous isotropic material, you know them all. Uh, it's, it's worth noting here, for a single crystalline material, for a single crystalline metal, for ceramic, there's very rarely 
a homogeneous isotropic material. Almost all single crystals are anisotropic. Most polymers, polymer chains themselves are anisotropic. What we're doing, yeah? Ah, yes. So, good question. So, homogeneous means it's uniform all the way through. So, there's no variation in the properties. All right. Is uniform versus heterogeneous, which would have varying material properties at different positions. And Isotropic is, we'll get into, hopefully, uh, probably on Friday, probably run out of time for it today, but basically it means that the properties in every direction are the same. So, means that my Young's modulus in the x direction is equal to my Young's modulus in the y direction is equal to my Young's modulus in the z direction. It doesn't matter if I, what direction I'm testing my properties, they're all the same in every direction. So it's, it's worth noting that no single crystalline material is actually homogeneous or isotropic, or, or no single crystal material is actually isotropic. Most materials are fairly heterogeneous. So if you remember all the different grains in, in a material or, or the different polymer chains, there's some variation of, of properties at some length scale. But for engineering materials, what we're going to assume is that they sort of average out. So there's enough grains in, in my part that it doesn't really matter what the size of the constituent grain is. Uh, or my, my polymer, there's enough polymer chains going in whatever direction that it doesn't really matter that there are polymer chains in there. I can just assume it's some uniform material. So uh, interesting stuff actually starts to happen when you get past this point, when you start looking at materials at sub-micron lengths or sub sub-millimeter, sub-micron length scales and getting to the fundamental properties of the materials, but that's a little bit beyond the scope of the course, so I'm probably not going to talk about that today, or maybe this quarter. You'd have to take a more advanced materials class. Uh, a couple more general mechanics things. If we take our stress-strain curve, or our stress and strain, stress and strain. We can define the energy. So, so in order to deform a system, you have to do work to it. You have to put energy into the system to deform it. We can measure that work is energy is our force times our distance. So F D Omega or Omega is some body volume. So what we can do instead, so if, if you remember some of your some of your intro physics classes, for work is force times distance. Now in a material there may be a, a non-uniform work being done throughout the system because the forces at every point may not be equal, the the distance, the displacement at every point may not be equal. So instead, we, we integrate our force over the whole body at every point, and we get some sum of work. What you can look at this instead, uh, as it, what you can, how you can look at this instead, is as an energy density. G density, which then is our integral of stress strain. So this may look familiar to, to some of you. So this is our, our little u. For a uniaxial tension test in the elastic regime, so do, do, do. in the elastic regime, we assume uh, da, da, da. Sick regime. we know that stress is equal to E strain. So our, our u in the elastic regime, integral of sigma t epsilon is equal to sigma squared over 2 e. Make sure I did that right. 
not giving you false information. Yes. So this is this is valid up to this point. So our epsilon, I'm going to call this the plasticity point. Sigma plasticity, where this is from zero to epsilon plastic. And we can define something known as a modulus of resilience. Modulus of resilience is at sigma plastic squared over 2e. So from this graph, it's basically the area under this curve here is our modulus of resilience. What we can do also is, is take the area under that curve for the whole stress strain curve. This is again for, for a uniaxial tension test. So we can define, if I wanted to look at all the way up to epsilon fracture or epsilon failure, the integral from zero to epsilon f of sigma d epsilon is something known as our tensile toughness. So that's effectively the, oh, which way do I want to do this? This way. The area under this whole curve is our, this is the oh, tensile toughness, and this is our modulus of resilience. So hopefully these are all something that are familiar to you. Hopefully you've, you've seen most of those quantities before, and this is generally a review, maybe with a slightly different spin. Uh, in your lab next week, you'll be doing a uniaxial tension test on four different materials, and you'll basically be measuring all of these experimentally. So you'll see how these quantities actually come up from an experiment, how you can go about processing data to get them, what exact nuances are in there, how do you define a Young's modulus when you have noisy data, how do you find an intercept between a graph when there may not be a clear point of where they're crossing, stuff like that. So that'll be kind of the goal of, of the, the lab next week. But, so all of these, oh, do, 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 do. what do I want to start? So all of these are, oh, side point, this is tensile toughness, a very different than fracture toughness. So when people report toughness, generally they're talking about fracture toughness, which is the resistance of a crack uh, or resistance to crack propagation of a material. So if I were to put a crack in a piece of paper and tear it, how resistant is it to that crack moving? That, that's the fracture toughness. This tensile toughness is, is not really related to that. There's, there's some correlation, but it's, it's, not, it's very different from that quantity. So be sure to, to keep those two points separate in your mind, fracture toughness and tensile toughness. This is, this is a strain energy quantity, the, the basically the amount that you have to pull a material, the amount of work you have to do to a material to break it. The other one, fracture toughness, is, is how easy it is to rip a material that's cracked. Uh, da, da, da. Okay, so these are all very specific definitions. So, not, or yes, very specific definitions kind of to an isolated materials case. So they work well with uniaxial tension, potentially shear, very, very simple tests that you can do experimentally, and they're very relevant from an engineering standpoint, but they're not very general. So what I'd like to do is take a couple steps back. So when, when I say here my, my stress is equal to E epsilon in the, the elastic regime, this is actually something that's known as a stitutive law. So the, the relationship between stress and strain is how, how those two relate is, is a constitutive equation. 
so it, it's material dependent. But stress itself is basically just a force balance on a body. Strain itself is actually just a geometric reorganization of the material. They don't matter, it doesn't matter what material you're applying a stress to, or what material you're straining, what material you're deforming. If I'm applying a load F to a material that's in a certain shape, it can be any material and the stress in it will always be the same. If I'm deforming a material in a certain way, if I, if I stretch it out in a certain way and it goes from shape A to shape B, then that strain in that material is always the same no matter what the material is. Now, the trick is how those two relate uh, versus if I pull a piece of rubber, if I, if I apply a tor force F to a steel, it may displace uh, unit one. If I apply that same force F to a plastic, it may deform a unit by, by 10 units. So I mean, depending on, on how, how much force I'm applying. So that relationship is known as, as a constitutive relationship. But I want to rewind back a couple steps to actually talk about stress and strain individually. So, do, do, do. Let me organize my notes because I have stuff all over the place now. So, let's talk about first stress. So, this, uh, hopefully, I'll get through some uh, chunk of this today. This will probably also carry on into Friday, but just as a heads up. So, stress, if I take kind of some arbitrary body shape and I apply some loads P to it do, do, do. so if I say a P1 P2 P3 P4 P5 all of a sudden this, this very non-uniform geometry I can't define a stress that's uniform throughout the body I can't say all the way through this whole thing there's, there's one stress sigma and it's just it's the area divided by the force because the area is no longer constant the force is no longer only in one direction it's kind of a weird complicated body so what I want to do is look at what the stress in a very small unit volume is so in this little sig in this little box what is the stress so I brought a prop so in, in mechanics this sort of a, a diagram is used very commonly, and it's affectionately or, or endearingly referred to as a stress potato because people almost always draw it as a potato, this kind of blob shape. So to help demonstrate, I brought a potato. <laughs> so if, if I were to apply some forces, some, if I were to push on this potato in a certain way, if I were to twist it or torque it, what's the stress inside this potato at a certain point? What's maybe a more engineeringly relevant example is if I take some weird body, so let's say this hole puncher uh, right here. So, so on this hole puncher, there's this is sort of lever arm here where when I, when I pull this thing, it's applying some force. So I'm applying, there's a little bit of a torque there, but mostly a, an axial force downward. But this is all of a sudden a weird curved shape uh, with there's a boundary condition here that may or may not be fixed. It's sort of just bent in. All of a sudden, in this thing, there's a very non-uniform stress distribution. So, so this is maybe more more relevant. What's what's the stress at some arbitrary point in this? The answer is kind of hard to solve analytically for most things, which is why we have finite element solvers and computers. But I like my potato example. <laughs> so if I pull on a potato, and push on the data. Um, anyway, so. If we want to figure out what the stress in this body is, what I'm going to do is, is draw this a little bit bigger as a unit box. Do, do, do. Da, da, da. Draw some stuff up. Let's make a coordinate system so we make sure this works. Find an X, Y, Z. So now in this body, do, 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 draw some stuff. I'm going to have some, so, so I, I, I'm going to say this is some unit element. So this is some unit width dx, dz, dy. So, so it's a unit cube or an infinitesimal cube. So we're going to assume that the stress is constant in this body, whereas 
realistically the stress is varying throughout the body. Ugh. At this point, uh, we have some sigma xx, sigma yy, sigma zz. I'm going to call this uh, a sigma xy. Oh, if I can sigma xy. I'm going to call this a sigma xz, sigma zx, sigma zy, sigma yx. Sigma Y Z. Here, uh, notation-wise, I when I say sigma X Y, it's the same thing as as tau X Y. Uh, sigma is just a, a, that I'm using that to denote stress. You can I may or may not use them interchangeably. Tau is generally used to to designate a stress, but when you have this this X Y subscript, it, it means it's a stress, so they're, they're the same thing. Uh, as a nice reminder, because I always get mixed up which one goes first, the X is the face direction. Let me make sure. So this is what's on which face it's on, and this is in the direction. So here, this sigma XY is on the X face, so the, the face facing in the X direction with an X normal and it's in the y direction. So that, that shear would be in a sigma xy here. As a, as a convention, we have positive stress being a tensile stress. So here I have my sigma xx going in the positive x direction, and that, that's going to be a, a tensile force. A negative sigma xx is a compressive force. I, I don't know why that is what it is, but that's kind of the convention that's popped up. Uh, da, da, da. So now that we have this stress cube, we can define a general, a general stress sigma, where now this, this underline means that it's a tensor or a, a matrix, sort of, da, da, da. where this stress tensor, xx, sigma xy, sigma xz, Sigma Y Y, Sigma Z Z, Sigma Y Z, Sigma Z Y, Z X, Sigma Y X. Do, do, do. So now, instead of just having a stress in in one direction, some singular stress, this stress is actually better represented as a matrix. So what we're going to call this matrix from a, from a solid mechanics standpoint is a tensor. There's a mathematical distinction between a tensor and a matrix, being that specifically being that a matrix is generally a, a two by two structure. A vector is a, is a, or two by two, an n by n structure. A vector is, a, is an n by one structure. Matrix is an n by n structure. A tensor is an n dimensional structure. So it can be n by n by n by n. And later on in the course, we'll see there's a stiffness tensor, which relates stress and strain. Stress here is a, a second order tensor because it's a, it's a two by or a, an n by n structure. Strain is also an n by n. The stiffness tensor is a fourth order tensor because it's n by n by n by n, which we'll come back to. I know it's a little bit of a weird concept, most of the time we represent them as matrices anyway, just because people can't visualize an n by n by n by n thing. Uh, but that's sort of why we do it. There's also, I think in electrostatics, electro where you, where you combine magnetism and, and mechanics, there's a sixth order tensor, which relates the electric field and the mechanical field all together in this kind of stupid sixth order tensor thing. But we don't have to worry about that because this is just solids. Uh, What's also important to remember is that this stress is a function now of x, y, and z in space. So in, in, our, in our stress potato body, this stress is no longer uniform throughout the thing. It's going to change at each point. Ah, crap. I'm already running out of time. So just a couple quick examples, uh, something to kind of ground you in. If I take a body here, 
and I apply some stress sigma to it with x, uh, y, z, my stress here is zero, sigma zero, 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 zero. So this is our uniaxial tension case, which again, we only have that one stress component. We can kind of ignore everything else. If I have biaxial tension, do, do, do. Ah. If I have biaxial tension, my stress tensor, uh, if I have sigma one, sigma two, and this is x, y, z, this is now sigma one, sigma two, zeros. If I apply a pure shear to a material, so I take my block, uh, not enough time, I apply some shear to the faces, my stress tensor is zero, tau, tau, zero, everywhere. So what we had seen before with our, with our nice uniaxial tension case still works in this context. It's just nice now because we can create a generalized state of stress throughout the body. And I'll, we'll go through some of the fundamentals of that on Friday. Uh, real quick note, I don't, I won't have office hours today from 11 to 12. I, I ended up having a meeting at the same time, but I'll be around for the next half an hour here for anybody who wants to talk.